I think I might be cheating with this one, because it's not even my story. There are no ghosts in it, no one gets shot or creeped on, but it, it's still one of the realest, scariest things I'd ever heard. So my brother is at this house slash birthday party where literally everyone is underage drinking. The party is on one of those cul-de-sac things, you know, like a dead-end street, but pretty. And what's also pretty frightening is that a buttload of people actually drove to the party and were planning on driving home. The house they were at had a thin driveway so all the cars were packed into a bottleneck. The night wore on and around one in the morning someone decided that they wanted to go home. They found the girl who owned the car at the front of the bottleneck and asked her to move her car so she could get out. She said she couldn't because she had a breathalyzer installed in her car and it wouldn't start until someone sober blew into it. They went around the party to try to find anyone who hadn't been drinking and couldn't find one. Another guy had the brilliant idea of asking the cool 20-something dude next door to do it. So an envoy of teens head over to the house next door and asked the dude living there if he could please blow into a breathalyzer so they could leave. The dude takes a minute to look the group over, takes a drag of his cigarette and says, You're going to give me $25 for every person at that party, or I'm calling the cops. The way my brother tells it, they actually thought the guy was joking, and a bunch of them just laugh it off before being like, No really, help us out with this. But the guy was deadly serious, and reappears at the door moments later with his cordless phone, showing that he's ready to call the cops if they don't cough up the money. That dude must have gouged hundreds of dollars from them that night, as they were straight up terrified of getting caught drinking, especially the girl with the breathalyzer thing installed in the car. Like, I get that he was doing something wrong, but the whole reaching out to a stranger for help and that's the way they act? Like, he could have just told them to get lost and call the cops anyway, but his first thought is, how can I make this work for me? Probably the worst birthday party my brother had ever been to. It seriously sucks that people like that exist. I'm going to take you back a few years to when I was working at McDonald's. For context at the time... I was a 16 year old female. Now at the McDonald's I worked at, when you are on headset, you answer people at the drive through You are normally required to be at the first window to also take payment. My job position was customer care manager at the time, so my job was to be on the front desk, but 99% of the time, they required me to be behind tills. So I was having a normal day, working a long shift, but having a normal work day. I happened to be on headset, and first window that day too. My headset buzzes, letting me know there's someone at my drive through lane. I go through to the first window to answer my customer, and this is how the conversation ensued. Hello, welcome to McDonald's, what can I get you? Oh wow, you got a beautiful voice. His voice was grunty and husky sounding. Not off-putting, we have all sorts of customers come through McDonald's every day, so it didn't give me the creeps or anything. Thank you, sir. How very flattering. What can I get you? I haven't decided yet. There's a long pause here. Can I come to the first window to decide? I want to see who I'm talking to. Now, we weren't very busy at this point. The creeper hadn't actually creeped me out. I mean, all he'd done was pay me a compliment, and we quite often had people complaining that they preferred face-to-face -face contact, so this certainly wasn't out of the blue or unusual. Yeah, sure, sir. That's fine. Wow, you're as beautiful as you sound. Thank you, sir. Have you decided what you're going to order? Are you an option? I laughed nervously at this. It was my first job, and I wasn't the rude kind of person where someone was paying me a compliment. I must also point out this guy must have been in at least his 60s. I remember he had one lazy eye that looked to the left, painfully awful teeth, and patchy dark brown hair. At this point, I was a little bit uncomfortable, but was still more than willing to take his order. I'll have a cheeseburger. Okay, sir, that'll be 99p. Are you paying cash or card? Without answering my question, he started asking me where I'm from, how old I was, etc. But it wasn't until his last question that I got super weirded out. What time do you finish work? Half seven, why? I didn't actually finish at half seven, but half seven was the first number that came into my head when I blurted it out. I finished at eight and would probably do some overtime too, but I wasn't about to let him know that. 
I can meet you if you want. I can pick you up outside and we can go somewhere. All the while he's saying this, he has this horrendous grin on his face and keeps winking at me. I'm really sorry, sir. I'm not allowed to meet customers outside of work. It's against employee policy. This was utter bull, but I needed him to leave me alone. And he carries on being insistent, but not getting the picture. And I cut the conversation short. Anyway, sir, sorry to be rude, but can I have the 99p for your cheeseburger? Ah, yes, sorry. See you at half seven. Off he drove to the next window and I was gobsmacked. I'd already said I wasn't going to see him. I was a little bit shocked, but was not going over there to give him the satisfaction of talking to me again. My co-worker came to me and said, Ew, that guy had a major crush on you. I wanted your number, but I didn't give it to him. He's old enough to be your dad, if not older. Anyway, I explained exactly what happened and how uncomfortable it made me. Half seven came around and my co-worker spooked. The creeper was actually waiting in the car park for me, just like he said he would. He sat halfway down the car park and you could see him just staring in. Our car park wasn't very big. It only had four rows of parking spaces, so he wasn't that far away and would have clocked me the minute I walked out the door. At this point, I'm freaking out and head to the back of the store where hopefully he can't see me. I had to stay in the back of the store for 40 minutes before we knew it was safe to come out. Fast forward a week and Creeper is back on drive through and guess who's back on headset at window one? Me. I heard his voice and recognized it straight away. I was hoping I'd hear your voice again. Why didn't you meet me the other day? Uh, one second, sir. I'll be with you in one second. I immediately handed my headset to my manager and gave him a quick briefing of the situation. He gladly took the headset and dealt with the customer from start to finish. When my manager came back to me to let me know he'd gone, he said the creeper had been asking my name, my address, and my surname. My manager said he was the most creepiest guy he'd ever met, and I was never to have anything to do with him again. If he came back to work while I was there afterwards, my manager would have to head me to the back room while he dealt with him. He still asked about me every time. So to the creepy McDonald's guy, let's never meet again. When you think LinkedIn, it's probably the last place you expect guys to be sending creepy DMs to girls. But sadly, and sometimes scarily, it happens with alarming frequency. It's a problem that me and many other girls have experienced while using the platform. So for a couple of years, me and a group of like-minded people have been campaigning for social media platforms to improve their privacy systems, including blocking and reporting methods to ensure the safety of women and girls online. But all my campaigning has been promoted by a very close call of my own. I work in photography. It's been my passion ever since I was a little girl and I managed to get my hands on my mom and dad's old Polaroid camera. The digital revolution only made it even easier for me to practice my vocation. And by the time you get to the Galaxy S21 Ultra, mine's charging on my desk next to me, you can do almost everything a professional photographer can do with a device that can fit into your pocket. But there's something very authentic and gratifying about the old school darkroom processes, and it feels like you're birthing something special instead of just capturing a passing image. And although it's more expensive, I pride myself on offering my clients a choice of both. And a great way of me meeting new clients and potential employers is LinkedIn. It's honestly a great app, and I really do recommend it, but like I said, its user base contains just as many creeps as every other kind of social media. It might be a comment about what you're wearing in your profile picture or asking would you relocate for the right role or the right man, winky face. Or in my case, it might be considerably more insidious and dangerous. Because one day I get a connect from a seemingly normal guy asking me if I'm interested in doing a photo shoot for him. I'm naturally a little bit skeptical as he's being quite cagey about what the shoot entails and the last time that happened it Turned out to be a couple wanting to take pictures of, you know. I give him my rate, and I tell him no nudity whatsoever. He then sheepishly mentions that some of the pictures would be topless, as they're for his wife, but promises no nudity or anything remotely sleazy. 
Handsome, but wholesome, I remember him saying. And, I don't know, the effort he was going into making his wife happy, that did seem super wholesome to me. I guess I let my feelings speak for me, but, but I accepted his offer and told him that we could meet at some studio space I had a share in downtown. Public, neutral ground, on-site security, safe. At least I figured it would be, because if I'd had any inkling of what would be in store for me in that studio, I'd never have met that guy there that day. So, on the day in question, I met the guy at the studio space I mentioned. He looked kind of nerdy, curly brown hair, glasses, looking rather unassuming in his poorly fitted navy blue suit. He seemed really anxious too, like almost verging on innocent. He told me he'd never done anything like this before and I really did believe him on that. Taking your clothes off for any reason can be very, very nerve-wracking, especially when the opposite gender is involved, which is half the reason I tend to avoid shoots like that. People's nerves are frayed around the edges and it can make for a really bad atmosphere between you and the subject, which is the polar opposite of what makes a good photo shoot. But like I said, the fact this guy was really putting himself out there just to make his wife happy... God, I suppose that hit me right in the feels. I plugged the door code in, welcomed the guy inside the studio, and then asked him how he'd like to start. For example, if he might like a few professional-looking shots since he appeared to be in his work clothes. He says sure, and I try my usual technique of just chatting with the subjects while I'm shooting. This tends to make them feel at ease, and if you can coax a natural smile out of them and capture that on film, pure gold. They'll buy that shot every single time without fail. The shoot is going rather well. I'm getting absolutely no bad vibes off the guy, so I initiate a conversation about his wife that'll hopefully lead into some topless shots. At this point, I should really add that it was pure altruism that had me gunning for shirtless pictures, as I'm entitled to charge a premium for such shots and the guy had agreed to that. If he turned out to be a creep, I could just avoid those kind of shots entirely, but since he'd yet to start acting weird, well, go figure. At first, the way he was talking about her was as sweet as I could imagine it would be. He was talking about how there was no one else in the world for him, that he'd known her for years before he'd finally decided to pluck up the courage to ask her out. He said she was everything to him, the first thing he thought about in the morning and the last thing he thought about at night. The only thing was, he didn't feel like he was man enough for her. He didn't feel like he projected the kind of masculinity she needed to stay interested in him. He'd said he'd been working out, watching his diet. He wanted her to find him sexy, not just cute, as he put it. And weirdly enough, I knew exactly what he was talking about, as it's something I feel like I've struggled with throughout my dating years. Sometimes you don't want to be mousy or adorable. You want to feel hot. You want people to burn for you. And with that in mind, I invited my subject to take his shirt off. The first thing I noticed was how true to his word he was about working out. I was shocked, but not entirely surprised. I mean, he had told me. But the thing that made me gasp was how his upper arms and torso were almost completely covered in tattoos, many of which looked like he'd done them himself. There was a handful of crudely inked pictograms depicting religious iconography from a variety of different Christian sects, but most of the tattoos were just short verses with markings underneath, and it was only when I looked through the lens of my camera that I realized that they were Bible verses. I'm almost completely stunned by what I'm looking at, but I do at least try throwing out a compliment saying what you like about the presentation, the dedication to covering himself was admirable, to say the least. When I asked him which tattoos were his favorites, and that maybe I can work them into the composition, he pointed to one in particular. I had to look it up to get it exactly right, but it was this one. Genesis 2.24 Therefore a man shall leave his father and his mother and hold fast to his wife, and they shall become one flesh. He told me that's how he felt about his wife, that they were of one body and one flesh. But unlike before, when all of his romanticisms just came across as sweet and wholesome, I started to find his philosophy deeply disturbing. He started to flex, showing off his muscles, 
and trembling with raw power as he did so. I mean, he was ripped, frighteningly cut, only it wasn't attractive. It was starting to get scary. I started to get really nervous by the time he started to show off some rather weird-looking scars over where his heart was. At first, I thought it might have been chickenpox scars or something, albeit in a very localized place, I guess you could say. But he went on to tell me that he'd traveled over to Italy a few years prior to take part in a kind of religious flagellation ceremony where he and around 30 other men repeatedly stabbed themselves in the chest with a kind of needle comb. I don't have anything against organized religion as such. People are free to practice whatever they want in my mind. But someone who hurts themselves because of how much they love God? I don't know. That just doesn't sit right with me. If there is a God, I don't think they'd want their children hurting themselves. Yet the thing that actually terrified me of the guy, not just nervous or cautious or whatever, was what he said towards the end of the photo shoot. I decided to ask him about his wife a bit more, just to kind of get him out of such an aggressive, macho headspace. And that's when he started to giggle. I can barely describe how horrifying it was to hear such a childish, infantile giggle come out of such a monstrous form. And the more he talked, the more I realized something about his wife, and that's that he didn't seem to know all that much about her only that he was counting on her being impressed by his topless photos, which by that point were far creepier than they were alluring. I wrapped the photo shoot up as quickly as I could after that. As much as they'd come on slowly, I never felt such a threatening aura come off of a subject in all the years as a photographer. He paid on time, left me a positive recommendation, and after that, I told myself I'd never have to deal with him ever again. But it was only later that I realized something truly terrifying about the guy, or rather, call it less of a realization and more of a theory. The way I see it, he didn't know much about his wife because they hadn't met. All he did know could have been gleaned from watching her, stalking her, and it makes me feel sick to my stomach thinking he might have used my pictures to, like, make a move on her or whatever. At least, that's the nightmare scenario that plays itself out every time I think about it. I just pray that, or maybe in this case, pray would be the wrong word to use. I just hope that I don't read about my subject in the paper or online, and a story about the latest young woman to fall victim to obsessive male violence. Whenever a large group of people are asked, what are you most afraid of? Invariably, somebody somewhere says, circus clowns. And sometimes, that person is me. Most people's cool raphobia, that's fear of clowns to the uninitiated, is down to those Stephen King's It adaptations. Shout out to Tim Curry's miniseries. You see those spiky yellow teeth when you're a kid, all like, Hiya, Georgie. And forget about it. Traumatized for life. And I didn't see the miniseries until just before the movies came out a few years back, so I can't blame my fear. Some people just find them creepy in general, which, again, I understand. But I'm pretty sure I was chill with clowns until my cousin's seventh birthday party when something happened that gave me a legit phobia that's lasted into my 30s. So, I'm like five years old, it's my cousin's seventh birthday party, and for some reason, he's obsessed with old-fashioned big-top circuses. I think it was maybe from watching Dumbo so much, but the point is, he's all about clowns, training lions, elephants, all that stuff. This gives his mom an idea to throw a circus-themed birthday party, which would include a visit from an actual real-life circus clown. From what I can remember, that party was awesome until the clown showed up. There was a bouncy house, snacks, party games, all that good stuff. And then after a while, the clown shows up. My cousin Jay is ecstatic because his mom managed to keep the whole thing a complete surprise so he's about foaming at the mouth with how happy he is. Clown guy does balloon animals, all the clown cliches, and then for whatever reason, he starts looking for two volunteers. He obviously picks the birthday boy on the guidance of his mom, so he just happens to pick me too. And that's when he starts tickling me. I hate being tickled. Always have, probably always will. 
Not like most people who find it slightly unpleasant or God forbid those weird tickle fetishists who actually enjoy it. Nah, I legit hate being tickled, even back when I was five. So the fact this clown dude is tickling me is already putting me on edge and I don't want to ruin the fun, so I remember just kind of playfully pushing him away. But he wouldn't take the hint. He keeps tickling me and singing this dumb song like tickle 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 tickle. And then right as I lose my temper, I turn to be like, get off me clown dude. I just see blood pouring down his face from under his round red nose. His laughing in that super creepy high pitched way actually tickling me and there's blood running down his face. I scream like a little girl. I bolted towards the house, screaming and crying, running full pelt at the glass patio doors, which just so happened to be shut. And boom, I'm out like a light. I woke up in the car on the way to the hospital. It felt like I was out for hours, but from what my dad told me it was more like a couple of minutes. Because I was zero to a hundred into those patio doors, I didn't remember getting knocked out, let alone how I'd been knocked out. All I knew was that it was the worst pain I'd ever been in from a severely broken nose and there was blood all over me and my last clear memory of it being tickled by a bloody clown or as I remembered it a monster trying to eat me. So as I woke up I was inconsolable and I don't think I calmed down until a nurse got some painkillers in me. Obviously I didn't see the aftermath of getting knocked out but apparently it was like a war zone. All the kids started screaming some of them thinking the clown guy had somehow caused me to run into the glass doors. Spoilers, he had. Jay was angry that I'd ruined his birthday party, but that's just something we laugh about now. I guess I see the funny side myself these days, but that doesn't change what the event did to my psyche. It ingrained in me a deep-seated fear of clowns that caused some awkward moments in the years that followed. I'm not proud of it, but... Not six months after it happened, I actually peed my pants in a shopping mall when I saw a guy dressed up as Ronald McDonald. Like, I'm serious. It messed me up for a long time, and even today the image of a circus clown provokes a pretty visceral reaction in me, even if I have learned to suppress it. I'm proud to say I managed to sit through the It movie, the first one anyway, after working up to it with the old Tim Curry series, which I credit with actually helping me get on top of my phobia. But yeah... That's why I'm scared of clowns. For context, I am female and currently 21 years old, though at the time of this event I was 16 years old. I have never viewed myself as an attractive person. I've always been kind of chubby. I had bad acne in my teen years. I never cared at all what I wore, and I almost never wore makeup. I was an extremely awkward teen who had barely any friends and next to no self-esteem due to a very abusive relationship I had a few years prior, but that's a different story entirely. My point is that I was a completely different person during this time and looking back, I know how naive I was and what I should have done instead to better protect myself. So it was the year 2015 and I was going on my very first cruise with my family. It was an eight days, seven nights cruise that was taking place a few days after a tsunami had passed nearby. After a rocky start, literally the boat rocked back and forth the first two days and everyone was miserable, and me suffering a slight panic attack during a routine evasion drill, I'm claustrophobic and really hate crowds, it ended up being one of the best weeks of my life and I thoroughly enjoyed myself. Some of the downsides to this cruise was the fact that it was a North State cruise taking place in October, which meant chilly weather and no swimming, and because it was during a school year, I was the only guest my age on that cruise. The closest age to me I think was either 6 years old or 40 years old, so that kind of stunk, although I did end up crushing hard on our assistant dinner time waiter who was around 30 years old and had the sweetest smile I'd ever seen. Anyways, time to get to the meat of the story. So as far as I know, most cruises have at least one formal night where everyone dresses up really nice for dinner and they serve special meals like lobster, steak, etc. As I said before, I wasn't the most attractive person out there, but I did doll myself up for this special occasion. I wore a turquoise knee-length dress, tan-colored high heels, my mom curled my blonde hair, and I put on some makeup that really made my blue eyes pop. 
I honestly did feel kind of pretty that night. Dinner was amazing and I finally got to try lobster tail for the first time. Loved it. I also, of course, made eyes and mildly flirted with our assistant waiter. I made him laugh because of how red my face would get whenever my dad called me out on it. So after our dinner, my family and I all decided to go our separate ways for the night. There was a bunch of events going on that each of us wanted to get to. Well, except for me, who spent most of the cruise finding random relaxing spots to sit and draw. I was, and I've always been, an avid artist. So anyways, after a couple of hours, I decided I wanted to find my dad for some reason that I don't exactly remember. My mom had told me that he was going to the karaoke thing going on, so I started making my way around the ship, looking for wherever this was happening at. That's when I met him. I noticed him staring at me, and at first it was flattering. Like I said, I was average looking and had next to no self-esteem, so having anyone of the opposite sex look at me and smiling made me feel good. He looked to be not too much older than I was and was dressed in a cruise employee uniform, so I decided to approach him and ask if he knew where the karaoke room was. His smile never left as I asked him, and in a thick Indian accent he told me that he didn't know, but that we could search together for it. I thought it was a little weird at first that he was an employee but didn't know where an event was taking place, but I brushed it off and thought it was possible for some newer employees to not know where everything was yet. So he and I started walking around the ship together and casually chatted while doing so. He told me his name was Felix and was 21 years old. He also, as I suspected, did recently start working for this cruise liner a few months ago. For the record, I did find him kind of cute and liked how comfortable he felt talking to me about his life. As we continued walking around, he told me about how he was born and raised in India, how his family was kind of poor how rooster fights were illegal back home, but he watched them anyways and stuff like that. I enjoyed listening to his stories about life in a different country, considering I've never been anywhere but America at this point in my life. We had eventually stopped looking for my dad and were just walking and talking together. We were now standing outside on the deck and leaning against the railing. I admired how beautiful and ominous the dark water reflected the stars. It was as if we were floating in the galaxy. It was completely beautiful. He then started telling me how lonely he was and how hard it is working on a cruise ship and watching hundreds of couples being romantic together while he has no one. I told him that I understood how he felt because I was also single and hated feeling alone. He looked at me and told me he was surprised that I don't have a boyfriend because of how beautiful I was. I blushed and looked away as I told him that most guys back home don't look at me twice and he was surprised by that. You know that feeling when someone or something is behind you, and you can't see it, but you know you can sense it's there? Well, I felt something behind my head, and when I turned around to find out what it was, before I realized what was happening, Felix's face was right in mine, and he planted an unexpected kiss on me. I pulled back in surprise, and he asked me what I thought about it. I stuttered nervously and tried to think of a reply. Now yes, I was a naive young person who was always looking positively at people, but I wasn't completely stupid. This is a 21-year-old stranger who was flirting with a 16-year-old girl. I also had the sudden realization that no one knew where I was or who I was with. Before I could even say anything, Felix started telling me how he knew of a couple of spots on this ship where we could be alone to do things together. I started panicking and really wanted to get away from him. Now another fault of mine is that I'm way too nice for my own good, and I'm always afraid of hurting people's feelings or coming across as a mean person, even when I'm clearly in a dangerous situation. I'm still too friendly to everyone now, but nowadays, I have much more of a backbone and wouldn't have a problem telling someone like Felix to kindly screw off. But as I said, I didn't have that confidence back then, and I had no clue how to get out of the situation. Felix put his arm around my waist and started guiding me toward one of the areas he was talking about. I started stuttering. Um, maybe we shouldn't. We just met and I... We might get caught and you'd be in trouble and my father might be looking for me. I know that sounds dumb, but I was trying to make him think of ways where this could be bad for him, so it seemed like I was trying to look out for him. Don't judge me too harshly. 
He told me not to worry about it because people mess around with staff sometimes and their boss never finds out. That only made me panic even more. He leaned in for another kiss and I stupidly let him because I was scared of making him angry. After the long, uncomfortable kiss, I slightly turned away and told him I just wanted to keep looking at the night sky. He insisted that we should start messing around because we don't have much time together. I tried to hold back from crying at this point. And by the grace of the good lord above, my phone suddenly made a noise and I noticed my father had texted me asking where I was. I tried to mask my relief, but I immediately told Felix that I had to get going because my dad was wondering where I was and that he was very protective of me. Felix showed his disappointment to me saying that, but then he asked me for my phone number. My heart sank and I gave it to him. Again, stupid young female who doesn't know how to say no. I'm aware of how foolish that was. It was a good thing I didn't give him a fake though because he immediately texted my number to prove its authenticity. Once I thought he was satisfied, I started saying goodbye and walking away. He grabbed my wrists and spun me back toward him and asked for a hug goodbye first. I sheepishly agreed and gave him a light hug. I wanted to start crying when he squeezed me tight and pulled me against his groin and asked if I could feel it, if you know what I mean. I quickly stepped away and sped walked towards my hotel room. I made sure he didn't follow me and once I was safely inside my room, I hopped on my bed and started crying. Of course, I couldn't tell my parents about this because I would be in trouble for putting myself in this situation, or so I thought. I promise my parents aren't really like that. I know now that in reality my former marine father would have tracked Felix down and let him know to never touch his daughter again. A few minutes into my cry and my phone vibrated with a text from an unknown number claiming it was Felix. I wanted to block him immediately but again, stupidly, I was afraid that would anger him and he would somehow find me. So I answered him and we talked for a few minutes. We kept talking about how he wanted to see me again before I left the next day, which at this point I repeatedly thanked God for and I kept telling him that it just wasn't possible because my parents didn't want me leaving my room for the rest of the night which was a lie. I did eventually end up leaving my room and asked an older female employee where the karaoke event was, which she immediately took me to. Side note, the room was literally two hallways down from where I first found Felix, and I kicked myself for that later. I found my dad and didn't leave his side for the whole rest of the night. Luckily, I was able to enjoy the rest of my night dancing around with my father and I did hide around him whenever I spotted Felix walking around who was making it obvious that he was looking for me. I know the story isn't as scary as the most on here but at the time it was terrifying to me and my own kindness could have got me into a very bad situation. The moral to my story is that everyone needs to be careful when going on cruises or other types of vacations. Just because someone wears an employee uniform doesn't mean they're trustworthy. There's many people out there who take advantage of kind people and want to use that against them. Just please make sure whoever you're with always knows where you are and don't put yourself into risky situations. Two summers ago, I downloaded the dating app Hinge. I'd heard from friends that it was one of the better platforms for LGBT folks to find dates, so being a lesbian, I decided to give it a go. I found it to be just as good as my friends had mentioned as the little prompts really give you an idea of what people are like before you actually connect with them. I hate to sound like this horror story is sponsored by Hinge and Raid Shadow Legends or something, but it really was refreshing to find a dating app that seemed to focus much more on personality than just a person's looks. Anyway, I'm just flicking through profiles, sending out the odd message here and there when I come across the profile of a girl called Amy. Amy was hotter than hot. She was literally my type too. Crop dyed hair, sleeve tattoos, but a painfully adorable little face with these big shining green eyes. On top of that, her job title said motorcycle mechanic, and there were legit photos of her working on old Harleys and whatnot, which again, I thought was like the hottest thing ever. I double tapped the picture of her working on the bike, typed in a message like, this is so cool and then just hoped and prayed that she'd be back in touch. It couldn't have been 20 minutes that passed before I got a little alert saying that Amy has invited you to start the conversation or something like that. I'm thinking, no way, 
Is this a real profile? Sometimes a girl might take literally weeks to match with you and here was Amy, hitting me up after less than an hour. I had my doubts, put it that way, but doubts that were quickly put to bed when she turned out to be charming, witty, and highly intelligent. We didn't always see eye to eye on certain issues, but the fact that she seemed reasonable and open to compromise was like the polar opposite of a red flag. It was like a blue flag or something. Something that screamed potentially wifey material over here. And as much as I tried not to hype the whole thing up, I was super excited to meet her to see if we had as much chemistry in person. So we arranged a meeting at a local coffee shop, nice and public for a first time meeting. We're talking on Telegram by this point too, so she was able to send me a picture of the outfit she planned on wearing just so I could recognize her. And oh my god, she looked gorgeous. I didn't think I could get any more nervous than I already was, but when I saw her in that flannel shirt with the sleeves rolled so her tats were showing, I swear I felt my blood pressure ramp up by five notches. Anyway, I take a few deep breaths, psych myself up to meet her, then head out of my apartment and around to the coffee place. Anyone who's been on a first date for the first time in a while will tell you how nerve-wracking it can be. Standing there, or sitting there, trying to look cool, while simultaneously being nervous as you're rubbernecking for any sign of your date. So, that's the kind of mood I'm in as I'm standing outside the coffee place, stewing in my own anxiety for 10 minutes, then 15, then 20. By the time I'd been waiting for a half hour, I was starting to get a little worried. Amy had mentioned that traffic was awful, so I figured she might be a few minutes late. But a whole half hour late? I was starting to think I was being stood up. I shoot Amy a text asking how far away she was. It takes a few minutes for her to see the message, but unlike her usual replies, which took a matter of minutes to type out, she doesn't send me anything. I figured that might be because she's driving, so I decide to give her a call just in case it's more convenient for her to talk that way. But again, there's no answer. I'm trying my best not to panic, telling myself like, it's fine, she's just busy, don't freak out. But I think deep down, I knew it was all too good to be true. We'd matched too fast, she'd been too nice, I mean she was objectively way out of my league but it didn't make what came next any easier to deal with. I'm practically staring at our message thread on my phone, praying she'll either call or I get that little Amy is typing thing so I can at least know that she's still there. Then thank God. I see that little typing notification, and I feel this pure wave of relief wash over me, expecting her message to say something along the lines of, Oh my God, I'm so sorry I'm late. But it didn't say that. It said something entirely different. And although I can't remember exactly what the message said, as I didn't exactly keep it around my inbox for long, it said something like this. Okay, I think this has gone on long enough, and I have to come clean. I'm not a lesbian. I'm not even a girl. Sorry to catfish you. I just thought you were hot and wanted to check you out in person. In person? What did they mean by in person. What followed was the most horrifying moment of revelation that I've ever experienced. Not only was Amy not real, or at least not the person I thought I was talking to, but the psycho creeper who got off on inconveniencing lesbians was actually there, somewhere not too far away, watching me. It made my skin crawl. I was angry, upset, confused, but the feeling that seemed to override all others was fear. The pure terror of being seen by someone or something that you can't see in turn. I start spinning around trying to find the creep staring at me, but no one seemed to be watching, or if they were, they were certainly doing a great job of hiding it. Then, and I'm not even sure what compelled me to do this, but I started looking up. Now the coffee place I was standing outside was surrounded by tall buildings, possibly the reason my instincts were screaming like, up, up, up. I must have looked like I was losing my mind out there, spinning like a top with this terrified look on my face, but suddenly, I saw him. Standing about five stories up in a large open window was the figure of a man. He was so high up that I couldn't quite make out his face, 
but he was definitely holding something in his hand, and I'd be willing to bet my left arm that it was a freaking cell phone. I'm guessing most of the units were apartments and they all had those large glass windows, but he was the only person I could see up there. It sure did look like he was staring down at me, but I mean, I didn't know for sure that he was staring at me. And then just when I figured I might just be imagining things and that there was no one actually watching me, just the sick troll that had tricked me into a fake date, he waved. The guy raised his hand and gives this slow, theatrical wave to make it perfectly clear that he was watching me. I swear to God I nearly puked right there and then. I was this horrible combination of nauseous and numb, and I've never felt like I was about to pass out in my entire life, but I feel like I came close right then. My head was just spinning with this like, this can't be happening, how could it be so dumb? No one that hot would ever like me. Of course it's a catfish, you're so stupid. Stupid, stupid, stupid. All I could do was just walk away with legs like jelly, wondering if I was going to scream or cry first. I've never felt so violated before, not without an actual crime being committed. I had zero recourse other than to report the catfish account, and no matter how upset I was, it wasn't like I could get the cops to arrest anyone over it. So yeah, I walked back to my apartment in a kind of daze, fell onto my mattress and just ugly cried into a pillow for like a half hour straight. It was seriously one of the worst days of my entire life and it put me off dating apps for almost two whole years. Even now, I have to apologize when talking to girls because I know I sound overly paranoid asking for video dates or whatever. I guess I'm lucky. And I can kind of blame COVID, but honestly, I don't care how paranoid or overly cautious I might seem. After what I went through, I can assure you, you can never be too careful when it comes to meeting internet strangers. I have been divorced for several years now, but not by choice. My now ex-wife Julia ended our marriage apparently out of the blue, citing claims of infidelity. There's just one problem. I never cheated on her. In fact, I was positively in love with her. My affections for her never dwindled in the least. I wasn't prone to spending a disproportionate amount of time at work or with friends, so I had given her no reason to think I was being unfaithful. Truthfully, she was a wolf in sheep's clothing. Unfortunately, it took a messy divorce for me to see her true colours. The divorce court judge believed her adultery allegations uncritically giving her everything she needed to wreck me financially and leave me with nothing. I considered pursuing custody of our two children, but I dropped the case when she threatened to accuse me of child abuse and molestation. Once she made that threat, I knew I had no chance of winning. The family court judge would have believed her just as easily and unquestioningly as the divorce court judge. So now I'm living in a two-room apartment, needing to work two jobs to make ends meet, thanks to alimony and child support payments. And I get to see my son and daughter every third or fourth Saturday. And frankly, I'm fortunate it's even that frequent. She's interfered with my visitation rights multiple times with full backing of the courts, and I dare not protest should she try to play the molester card. Some months ago, she started allowing them to come over to my place every other weekend. That's when I began to notice some problems. My son had a bruise and cut on his arm. I asked him what happened, and he shrugged it off by saying that he got into a fight at school. The next time I saw them, my daughter also had a bruise, and she used the same excuse as my son. That's when I started to grow worried both of my kids getting into fights at school within a couple of weeks of each other. I mean, it's not impossible, but I never really bought it. Over the next few months, I began to notice other problems. Their clothing began to look worn and exceedingly dirty, and both of them had noticeably lost weight. This didn't make sense to me. My ex was getting more than enough money from me in terms of child support. There was no reason for my kids to be looking like this. 
I tried asking my son and daughter what was going on, but neither of them would say much. This raised some red flags. I couldn't afford a private investigator at that point, when fortunately a friend of mine who was far better off financially agreed to help me out. So I asked him to install a security camera for my apartment. When I asked why, I told him, something tells me I might be needing one soon. After a few weeks, the private detective met with me and my friend at my apartment, and the information he provided us was upsetting to say the least. He had numerous photographs of my ex meeting with shady characters in out-of-the-way places purchasing drugs. In some of the photos, my ex was shown walking out of shopping malls with new shoes and very expensive clothing. She had been using my child support checks for anything but supporting our children. The last two photos were taken from outside the house, and the detective got clear shots of my ex with raised fists while my children were in a defensive position and sobbing. So much for the claims that they were getting into fights at school. He told me one more thing, that my ex might have spotted him at one point or may have noticed him a little earlier and got suspicious, but he couldn't say for sure. Whatever the case, I had the dirt on this loathsome witch, and I was going to expose her. Later that same night, I was woken up by a persistent ringing on my doorbell. I stumbled to my front door and opened it up. It was my ex-wife. She looked like she was ready to shoot lasers from her eyes. If looks could kill, I would have died from a heart attack on the spot but I kept my composure. What the hell do you want at this hour? You hired someone to follow me, didn't you? To take pictures of me? Oh, so you saw him, huh? I said, taking a measure of sadistic pleasure at making her realize she was screwed. What the hell did you do that for? I had my reasons. Whatever the case, I've got the goods on you. Your ass is going to prison, and you're never going to be seeing the kids again, not if I have anything to say about it. She stood there silent for a few seconds, her rage seething. If I can't have them, neither will you. Suddenly she pulled a knife. I reacted a little too late, and she stabbed me in the shoulder. I stumbled back into my apartment with her trying to plunge the knife deeper. I shook her off, but she took a slashing motion and got me in the arm, leaving an ugly gash. I grabbed my living room lamp and tossed it at her. It struck her in the head, and she was out cold. The police arrived, and I told them everything. My ex had regained consciousness by the time and tried to play the victim, saying that I was being rough with her and she only stabbed me in self-defense. I told the cops I had a security camera, and it would prove my side of the story. I knew I had made the right call having it installed. My ex got a pretty hefty prison sentence, combining her illicit drug use, neglect and physical abuse of the children, as well as her attempted murder of me. She would be old and grey by the time they let her out. I couldn't immediately take in my children due to previous financial ruin, but the court agreed to grant me full custody once I got back on my feet. For now, my kids are staying with my parents, but when the time comes, I look forward to rebuilding my relationship with them. It all started with a Zoom call. At least, I only became aware it was happening because of a Zoom call. For all I know, it could have been happening for much longer, but the day of the second post-lockdown work meeting was the first time I noticed it. We're in the middle of a pretty tedious brainstorming session with a few members of marketing when a coworker interrupts whoever's talking to address me by name. It actually made me jump at first. I was totally tuned out, so... Hearing my name brought me right back around again. I respond, Huh? Uh, yep, I was listening. When I notice the person who addressed me is now closely studying their own laptop screen. I don't mean to alarm you, they said, but I think someone's watching you through the window behind you. I know exactly which window he's talking about, so I turn, a bit nervous at the idea of discovering he's right, only to see that there's no one there. I'm more relieved than anything, to be honest. I figured he was playing a joke on me because he clocked that I was nodding off during the meeting, and I'd be lying if I said I didn't maybe deserve it a little bit. 
Very funny, I said, and a few of the other callers had a little titter at the impromptu prank. I'm sorry, but I wasn't joking, the guy said. Did no one else see that? I'm so sure. Eh, hey, you're probably just seeing things. Someone else chimed in, and within a few minutes, the whole thing was completely forgotten. A smudge on the screen, a bit of lag on the call, eyes playing tricks. There were a hundred ways to explain it. The truth was literally unthinkable at that stage. A short while later, the exact same thing happens. The same guy interrupts, only far more urgently this time, saying, Look, look, it's right there. I'm not imagining it. You can all see that, yeah? I know what he's talking about, only I don't turn around immediately. I look at my own webcam feed to see what he was talking about, and right when I see it, what's clearly the silhouette of a head in the window behind me, I hear one of the other callers say like, Oh, wow, I see it too. I spin around just in time to catch the quick blur of whoever was watching me, ducking out of view. I'm actually really creeped out at this point because it obviously wasn't just somebody walking past my ground floor bedroom. Someone had actually stopped to stare inside. My window isn't even facing the street. It's at the side of the apartment block like you have to actually go out of your way to find it. Now I'm only 5 foot 3 and I'm 8 stone which for any Americans reading this means I'm tiny. And I had to make sure if someone was actually creeping on me they weren't just hiding out and waiting until I was vulnerable. So, phone in one hand, kitchen knife in the other, I tell the Zoom call that I'll be right back and then head out to make sure that everything is kosher. It's peak lockdown during all of this, so the streets are pretty much deserted, so I think I'd have noticed anyone wandering around. But there was no one, not a soul in sight. So I guessed, or rather hoped, that it was just some neighbor kids messing around, maybe looking for a wayward ball or something. About a week goes by and the whole window face incident has been at the back of my mind the whole time. For a lot of young women who live alone, the idea of being targeted where we're most vulnerable is frankly terrifying. So the prospect of that nightmare coming to life just didn't bear thinking about. I'm not saying I was on edge the whole time or that I lose sleep over it or anything, but let's just say I held my keys a little tighter in my fists whenever I walk down the street my apartment block is on. But anyway, at one point I head out to the grocery store to pick up food and I end up caught in one of those super long COVID lines that you're stuck in for like 40 minutes before you're allowed into the store to buy your stuff. This is on top of the fact that the store near me had implemented this dumb one-way system in the aisles in an attempt to stop the spread. My point is, a trip that would have normally taken like half hour ends up taking more like 90 minutes and an annoying amount of my day has been completely wasted. So, I'm already in a bad mood by the time I get back to my apartment, only to find that the front door has been bashed in. Apparently, there had been a break-in while I was out. If only criminals could work from home. It seemed obvious that it was a burglary at first. All my stuff had been strewn around, drawers and cabinets were opened and emptied. The TV was still there, along with my PlayStation, but... Most break-ins just go for jewelry and phones I heard, anything small that they can pawn easily. Obviously, I call the cops like there and then, who arrive within a half hour or so. They advise me to help them look around the apartment for anything that might be missing, valuable electronics and whatnot, but I told them I already looked and that nothing obvious seemed to have been taken. My bedroom looked like it had been hit by a bomb. Clothes had been strewn all over the place. Whole drawers had been pulled out and flipped, like whoever broke in was looking for something. One of the cops spends some time looking around in there before he called out to his partner. Hey, we need forensics up in here is what he actually said. I asked him what the deal was, if he'd found something that I should know about. Both cops had been warm, friendly, and helpful up until that point, but when I asked him why forensics was needed... One of them told me not to worry about it and to stay out of my bedroom for the time being. It was no big deal at first. I was just grateful that they showed up so fast, even if they did wear masks and insist on keeping six feet between us at all times. So by the time forensics team showed up, I'm out front of my apartment building talking to my mom on the phone. 
Only when I see what they're actually doing in my apartment, it triggers what I can only describe as a mini freakout. Guys in gloves and white coverall suits have been scooping big handfuls of my underwear into bags, sealing them, then taking them out to the truck outside. And then it dawns on me, whoever broke into my apartment had left DNA on my underwear. Now, I probably don't need to tell you how exactly they'd done that. The whole thing grosses me out too much for me to actually type it. But the thing that really got to me was, if I'd actually been home that afternoon, there's no telling what would have happened if some violent perv had actually gotten their dirty hands on me. But anyway, the story does actually have something of a resolution and thankfully a happy ending, because they had this guy's DNA. Police were able to match it on their database with a guy who'd had multiple run-ins with the law for public exposure, among other things. He was arrested, and he's now looking at three years in prison for aggravated burglary, some kind of charge like that. But the whole thing came full circle for me in an interview with some detective, who'd mentioned that this guy liked casing his victim's places before he struck. Over the past month or so, have you seen anyone hanging around your apartment who doesn't live there? Maybe someone looking through your window. He said it. He literally said it. It was him, that day when I was in the Zoom call. It was him that had been looking through my window. He'd been stalking me for God knows how long, and when it came for him to actually get me, only by the grace of God was I lucky enough to have been out grocery shopping. Otherwise, it doesn't bear thinking about what might have happened. In the weeks after the death of my brother, I found myself looking for comfort on the internet. Around four months had passed and I discovered a forum created for twins dealing with the grief of losing their other twin. Whether from ending their own life or illness, thousands across the world were brought together for this one singular purpose. I admit I was somewhat shy about posting and remained a bit of a lurker. However, as I became more comfortable with the community, I grew into a daily poster and was able to befriend many on the forum. A select few of these people and I became very close and did much to help one another to work through our grief. One member, a girl who said she was from Montana, probably did the most of all to help me move forward. She had lost her twin sister in a similar circumstance just as I had my brother and had a specific insight many others in the forum did not. It was not long until her and I were confessing our deepest secrets to each other and it was very nearly as if I hadn't lost my twin at all. You may ask why I would tell a complete stranger all my deepest and darkest secrets. I suppose the anonymity was the reason. Even if the person knows or thinks they know all about you, they still don't know your true identity and location. That aspect of the internet gives you carte blanche to bear your soul to a person you're confident doesn't know the true you. The connection we formed over my time on the forum was the best thing that could have happened to me at the time. However, my confidence in my anonymity and comfort with this person would ultimately come back to bite me and make my life on the internet and outside of it complete torture. It was an average ordinary morning when I discovered my friend's true face. I fired up my computer and opened my mail only to be overwhelmed by a barrage of angry and vicious messages. As I scrolled through each one, it soon became clear what was happening. Someone very close to me had dumped all my terrible secrets onto the forum and wider internet. I tried to deny it to myself for a long time who the identity of the person was, but I was eventually forced to face the facts. Apparently, my supposed friend on the forum had told everyone there some of my private feelings towards my dead brother and the way in which he chose to end his life. We all have those opinions or feelings we keep to ourselves because we know they wouldn't be popular with those around us. I never said anything terrible or anything like that, but most of my words surrounded my anger toward my twin. I probably could have phrased some of them better, but that's the fatal flaw of the internet. Without context or hearing the person's tone of voice, things can get lost or misconstrued. Over a short time, the situation would become far worse. The threatening messages started. People I had once called friends were now threatening my life. It wasn't just online, either. The messages were soon coming to my phone. This fact only proved to cement her guilt since she was one of the very few who had my number. 
The most terrifying aspect of the phone messages was that many knew my real name and address. This was when I truly came to fear for my life. I'd become a bawling and panicking mess. When I would finally summon up the courage to confront her about this, the pieces would all begin to fall into place. Her written reply laid it all out clearly. I had foolishly walked right into the clutches of a person who hated me and my family. My friend, all these months, turned out to be the drug-addicted ex-girlfriend of my brother. In my opinion, she was one of the major reasons he took his life, and my family agreed, which is why we had barred her from the funeral and anything taking place that day. She swore she'd get back at us, and boy, she did. Apparently, she had been on the forum one day and guessed who I was. Just to be sure, she pretended to be a bereaved twin and started to suck up to me. Once it became obvious that I was who she thought I was, she saw it as an opportunity to get her revenge. In hindsight, things were starting to make more sense. She'd always been a bit pushy when trying to get me to tell her a secret. To make me more comfortable, she'd tell me something, which we all know now was a load of BS, and I would always fall for it. All through her message, it was clear she had no remorse for what she had done. In fact, upon hearing of the many threats in my life, she decided to push things along by doxing me. What she hoped to happen had, and she was very pleased by the result. This final message was the last time I'd heard from her. No replies would come to my following emails, and soon after, I'd be forced to get a new address. After I spoke with my family and our lawyer, I took their advice and got rid of all my prior connections. This included having to move to a new place. I was, and still am, concerned about the remainder of my family. Although my brother's ex was able to get her revenge on me, the rest of them were assumed to still be in danger. My father assured me that they would be fine, and from all appearances, he may be correct, at least for now. I had stepped away from the internet for almost nine months, and am just now beginning to dip my foot back into the pool. Naturally, I will never return to the forum in which all these problems spawned, Even though I've not yet had any run-ins with anyone from there, I will never again expose myself to the level of being identified. Even the account from which this story has been sent is a one-time use throwaway, so if any of those coming across this story may have any questions, I'm sorry. None will be forthcoming anytime soon, and certainly not from this account. If there's anything you can take away from this mishap, perhaps it is a lesson of caution. I and many others have discovered to our detriment how big of a sewer the internet can be. Like the sewer, there lurk many rats. On the internet, the rats are waiting and hiding to destroy others. Many have no reasons. They're just evil. I suppose I'm trying to advise you all to be careful and remember that no one on the internet is really your friend unless you know them in real life. And although many perils linger there, the internet is not real life. This was three years ago, and I started college down the country. I was 18 and on Tinder, and had never actually met anyone from it, but would just swipe through guys to be nosy and see who was on it. I was swiping right on some, and about a half hour after, got a message from this guy, who according to his account, was roughly 20 kilometers away. We made some small talk, and it was awkward and I stopped replying. A day later, I received a friend request for him from Facebook. Mind you, I have a common enough name, so it would have taken ages for him to find me. We had no mutual friends, and my Tinder photos are not on my Facebook page. The only thing I had on it was the university I was attending, so maybe that's how he found me, but I don't know. I then quickly got a follow request on Instagram, and he somehow found my Snapchat username. I don't even have my social media, and it's a variation of my full name with extra added vowels and an underscore. I was freaking out at this point. I messaged him asking how he found my full name, and he just replied, I think we have a connection. I really want to get to know you better. I unmatched him, deleted my Tinder, and blocked the accounts he tried to add me on all social media. After that it was quiet for a few months. I was staying in digs and was knuckling down as I had a lot of assignments from the get-go. This was towards the end of November. 
I had no assignments due for two weeks, so I decided to go out with some friends. One of my friends stayed in student accommodation and the other was commuting, so she was staying with the other friend. I decided to walk back to my digs, as my landlady would probably freak out if I wasn't home that morning, and I really wish I got a taxi instead. I walked back and was about 15 minutes from the local nightclub we were at. It was at 3am, and I was at the front door of the house opening up. The door was annoying, as it had two different locks, and I had to pull the handle towards myself to help open it up. It's also tough when you're tipsy, and trying not to wake up the family you're staying with. As I finally unlocked the door, a dark car pulls into the housing estate I'm staying in. It's quite big, and has a big green area in the middle for children, or people playing with their dogs. The car comes towards me, so I quickly get inside and lock the door. The car pulls into the driveway of the house I'm staying in, and just sits there with the full headlights on. I'm there shaking and too afraid to move from crouched below the door as there's frosted glass about halfway up. As I get the courage to go upstairs and look out my bedroom window to see who it is, the car pulls out the driveway and speeds off. A few days later I get a new friend request off the creepy Tinder guy on a new Facebook profile, even though there were no pictures on the account, just the same name I blocked it. It was enough. It even caused me to transfer universities the next year. Thankfully, I haven't heard anything since. I don't know if it was just bad timing, or if it was that creep on Tinder that sat in the driveway, but it was petrifying. If you take anything from this, be careful who you let on social media or dating apps, and what information you have up. 